Okay, quick map. This is where it's located. This is also a pretty good idea of the size of it. It is the largest urban boundary expansion in Hamilton's history. And uh, it's, uh, if you do the measurements, it's just a little bit smaller than Hamilton Harbor. 4,574 acres. It's on prime agricultural land. It is uh, at the airport, the highest point of land between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, and that has significance with respect to the waters that uh, flow both on the surface and groundwater uh, through the Hamilton area. It's the headwaters of four of our major streams, uh, including portions of Spencer Creek, the largest creek in Hamilton, uh, the Welland River, which goes into the uh, Niagara River, 20 Mile Creek, which empties out into Lake Ontario, and Big Creek, which goes into the Grand River. Uh, and as a result, there are three conservation authorities involved uh, in jurisdiction on some of the lands that are involved here. And uh, the maps uh, that uh, they put together show that this is also a sensitive groundwater recharge area. And if you've been following things with respect to the PFOS issue at the airport, there has already been some significant pollution in the Welland River as a result of chemicals coming off the airport. Uh, actually, three different kinds of chemicals uh, that have polluted the uh, uh, Lake Nipeco, the Bidwell Conservation Area Lake, as well as the Welland River. This uh, is a little more detailed in terms of location. You see some of the boundary roads there, Garner, 20 Road, Upper James, White Church Road, Fiddler's Green, where the 403 is, where the Lincoln Alexander Parkway is, uh, and the airport in yellow in the center there. Not all of this is actually at play directly uh, when we start on Monday. Uh, this is what the city tried to get in 2004-2005 period, uh, where, as Peter pointed out, being back, and uh, are now attempting to get a somewhat smaller area, and I'll show you that in the future maps here. The justification the city is using is uh, population and job forecasts. Uh, the 2031 population numbers for Hamilton are quite optimistic, uh, expecting us to get to 660,000. We're currently about 520. Uh, and as part of that, that we would require an additional 36,000 industrial jobs. Uh, and the justification then for expanding into this area is to provide the land to provide for those jobs. The assumption the city is working with is that they can get 37 jobs per hectare. So that works out to about 960 hectares that they think they need. They have assumed that the old industrial areas of Hamilton, the Bayfront in particular, have virtually no available land. This is a bit of a surprise to many of us who've driven down Burlington Street, but that's the position they've taken. Uh, they're saying the Bayfront, for example, is 99% full, and there's only 20 hectares there. Hectare is two and a half acres, so 50, 47 acres is what it works out to in the Bayfront. Greenfield Business Parks, the city number for that is 718 hectares. These are lands that are already in the urban boundary, already designated for industrial development, and in many cases already serviced. They include areas such as the North Landbrook Business Park, the uh, Sony Creek Business Park, the Ancaster Business Park, and the Airport Business Park. And I'll talk a little more about this last one a little bit later. But, uh, and then what they do by a complicated set of calculations, and I'll show you the chart, but I'm not going to try to explain it. Uh, they are able to reduce this by various factors to conclude that they need another 828 hectares. So you take 960, you subtract 718, and you get 828. So that's the way the numbers work. And those are all going to be issues within the hearings coming up. This is the uh, uh, slide that the uh, chief witness for the city plans to use in terms of explaining how those numbers were arrived at. Uh, I put arrows, those black arrows are mine, the rest of it is his. Uh, the top black arrow on the right, the red one shows the 960 number. The uh, one in the center shows the 718 number. That's what the uh, land that we have now in Greenfield Business Parks, uh, 20, 20 hectares in Brownfield and the rest of Greenfield. And then the seven, 
Now he's lowered his numbers to 720. And I'll go in and explain that a little bit later in terms of the change that's taken place. There has been a fairly significant change, we think, uh, in the city's position, uh, a retreat of substantial proportions. This is the map of the area that we're talking about now in terms of what the city hopes to bring into the urban boundary. And I've labeled it, uh, the, the map is theirs, the not labeling is mine. Uh, the airport itself in the center is 1,460 acres or 591 hectares. It's not currently in the urban boundary. They want to bring it in the urban boundary. And that sounds fairly innocuous, uh, but if the airport continues on the path that it's been on for some time, we will have a lot of available developable land there in not too long uh, a future ahead, uh, because this airport doesn't look like it's doing very well. Uh, just uh, south of that, uh, there's a smaller area labeled 138 hectares. That's the airport expansion lands that the uh, city is asking to be included in the urban boundary as part of this overall picture. And then over top, uh, on, the high, uh, on the upper portion, you see 828 hectares. Uh, this is uh, 828 hectares is developable within that colored area. Uh, 662 is what they call net developable. And 262 is green space. The numbers there, the 262 actually adds to the 828. It's not a subtraction number here. It's not another interesting calculation. Uh, the green space is area that they cannot develop on for various provincial rules, woodlots, wetlands, uh, other areas that uh, are stream along streams and so on that uh, are required to be protected. Council, in its wisdom, added 40 hectares uh, at the tail end of the discussions back in 2010. Uh, I've labeled those two pieces. One is the Ancaster Christian Reform Church up on Garner Road. The other is part of a farm, half of which was in and the other half out, and the farmer asked for the whole thing to be put in. So we're actually talking about an additional 40 hectares on top of that 662 or 828. So working with the 662 at this point, and I'll explain what's changed there, uh, that works out to uh, 1,635 acres of what they expect to be able to develop. The separation between developable land and uh, gross developable land is that the city doesn't want to count in its calculations the land that it expects to use for roads, for uh, utility corridors, for sidewalks, for right-of-ways, that sort of thing. And the, they use a, a simple calculation of saying, Whatever the number that we need it is, whatever the number we need is, uh, we add an extra 20% to uh, what we actually need. Uh, so the 662 is the uh, net to gross figure. It's 80% uh, of the 828 that they are actually asking for in that portion of it. This is forecast to accommodate 24,500 jobs. Um, and that's fairly straightforward, 37 per hectare times the number of hectares they're working, working with. Uh, $66 million a year in net profits is what they uh, have projected we will get. Uh, so uh, this is being presented as a very lucrative financial approach. Uh, the, six, six, the 66 million figure is not actually related directly to the Eritropolis. It's related to how the city calculates its numbers uh, for any industrial development. So it appears that business taxes in Hamilton are quite lucrative for the city. Uh, so this $66 million is actually a net on what it will cost to the city to service uh, and provide services for these, these lands. Uh, in, on an ongoing basis, on a year-to-year uh, -year basis, not the initial servicing, the infrastructure, uh, and uh, subtracting that from the total taxes, they'll still think they'll make a $66 million profit. Uh, they would make even more if they were doing this on brownfields because they don't have to service those brownfields, but they didn't mention that in their calculations. 
The airport uh, is projected in uh, the calculations to grow to 9.4 million passengers a year. Uh, it's currently at about 330,000. <laughs> and actually, if uh, if you look at those numbers, they may be a little bit misleading because you get counted twice. You get counted when you fly out, you get counted again when you come back. Uh, and uh, they expect that if this is approved, they will have sufficient employment land to last for the next 20 years until 2031. Uh, and the area that got left out, that they tried to get before, they want set aside for future expansion after 2031. In terms of the costs and the risks, the city's calculation is to service this area to provide widening and new roads, uh, to provide pipes, to provide other infrastructure, hard infrastructure. The capital cost will be $353 million. Those are 2010 figures. Most of these are. Uh, they have some capacity, they say, to provide sewer and water with, with existing pipes outside the area. That doesn't change the 353 million figure, but it does say that 20% of this area could be serviced without building new trunk sewers. They didn't include in the calculation what the cost of those new trunk lines would be. Uh, they run from the airport down to Woodward Avenue, 25 kilometers. Uh, we have seen the cost price for the trunk water main, or pardon me, for the trunk sewer, it's $126 million. Uh, we don't know the cost of the trunk water main, but both of those would be required if this all proceeds. Uh, if they are limited to 20% of it, those might be avoided. In addition, we are expanding our water and sewer system generally, and particularly our sewage treatment plant, uh, and it's an $800 million cost that's been put on that. Uh, some of that is proceeding now, some of that is now been put off until early 2020s, um, but a portion of that clearly needs to be allocated to the airport costs as well. So we're looking at a minimum of a half a billion dollars, or about a thousand dollars for every man, woman, and child in Hamilton. That's to provide the servicing. Uh, this isn't a particularly attractive area for business in a number of respects. One of the respects is that we've had an airport business park there for 20 years and it has yet to attract anyone. Uh, secondly, uh, because it's beside an airport, we have some particular difficulties in doing stormwater management. So stormwater management usually is dealt with by creating stormwater ponds. And you've seen these in the residential areas and in the suburban areas. And that's intended to prevent excess flooding when we have large rainfall, at least some kinds of our trend fall when it gets really extreme as it has more recently, uh, they usually aren't up to handle all of that. But the calculation by the city consultants is that the cost then of doing stormwater is going to be somewhere between a hundred thousand and a million dollars a hectare. And that cost, in theory, would be borne by the developer of those lands. Uh, in practice, uh, when Maple Leaf arrived, uh, we cut a deal to provide the stormwater for them stormwater management for them at the North Landbrook, even though that was not part of our rules. So we may end up with the cost of those things as well. The reason it's so high is we've got an airport sitting there, and the reason you can't have stormwater ponds is stormwater ponds attract birds, and birds have a nasty habit of flying into airplanes. Or to put it another way, airplanes have a nasty habit of flying into birds. So we can't have stormwater ponds. We're also the highest point of land so stormwater management gets particularly difficult. We're in the headwaters of four streams that need to be protected. Uh, all of those factors make this a difficult spot to do development. There are a bunch of restrictions associated with the airport itself, uh, noise restrictions that affect primarily residential development, but there are a, a number of restrictions on the use of various kinds of equipment, electrical equipment of various sorts, which may interfere with radar or other airport operations. So for example, the proposal to put some wind turbines near Smithville uh, is being opposed by NAV Canada. Uh, they sent them a letter saying, you're too close to the airport, you'll affect our radar. And you think Smithville is a good 10 kilometers away uh, from the airport, but uh, that distance is uh, affected. And there are a bunch of restrictions that are written into law that you can't have this kind of equipment or that kind of equipment. And those things would restrict what kinds of businesses might locate there. Uh, city isn't very precise on this. They've actually, in their secondary plan, 
instructed, set out an instruction that anyone who wants to develop in this area needs to go and talk to the private operators of the airport to find out whether or not they're going to have problems developing there. Which is a little tricky because the private operators of the airport also own some land out here and are just in development themselves. So it's kind of like going and talking to the competition with your plans before you make them. So we have growth forecasts versus the actual experience, and uh, I'll talk a little more about that. We have an uncertain global and provincial economy. This idea is, goes back to 2001, and a lot of things have changed since then, as all of you have experienced. And we have an existing uh, collection of Greenfield business parks. I've got 755 here. 718 is a number that they've actually come down from the 755 one. This is one of the maps that's in the city documents to show the occupation of the area, and it's not showing the, well, it's showing the airport, but the airport one is 7% occupied, it's 93% empty. Uh, it was established, as I said, in 1992, and has yet to attract any new businesses. And the Bayfront, they're saying, is 99% occupied, and then the numbers are there for other business parks. With respect to areas in the old industrial area, when they were questioned, when the city staff were questioned as to why there wasn't more available, uh, because it certainly looks like there's more available, uh, they argued that they can't tell whether something is available. Uh, that's a subjective uh, decision, and they can only tell when it has been declared as on the market vacant. Uh, so, for example, the steel companies, particularly U.S. Steel, Old Stelco, uh, are not included in their numbers as a result, and uh, uh, many other properties where uh, the parking lots are empty, the, bit, the warehouses are empty, the buildings aren't being used, uh, but they're still standing and they're still paying taxes, were counted. The way they did their calculation on what was available was it had to meet two criteria. One is it is not paying taxes, and the other is that it's derelict. It had to meet both of those criteria to be declared available. So as a result, they didn't find much. And of course, their major argument, the real uh, thing behind this is they're arguing companies don't want to move into this area. Companies want to move into greenfield properties. Uh, and that may be true, certainly, for some companies. And uh, that has been uh, one of the reasons why we've ended up continuously using agricultural land, uh, irreplaceable agricultural land in southern Ontario, for our growth rather than uh, getting some reuse out of areas that are underutilized or no longer be, being made use of. Uh, and when you're talking about 70% of the land at the Aerotropolis being projected to be used for warehousing, trucking, and wholesale trade, all of those facilities would, what, would fit very nicely on the Bayfront, along Burlington Street, close to the QEW, on the rail lines, beside the port, it wouldn't be beside the airport, but the airport hasn't necessarily attracted much at this point. So there's a, a, a number of reasons why we're concerned about this. What do I need to do to get rid of that thing? Uh, okay. So there's costs. Uh, there's the viability of uh, it, even if it went ahead. Uh, this question of the real agenda, uh, as I said, this is what the city says it wants to do. It wants this for employment land. A number of people who own land within this have appealed this decision. They're not appealing expansion of the urban boundary. They're arguing that their lands are better suited for residential. And this has been a long-standing issue in other business parks in Hamilton and in other parts of the province. People own land there, it's designated for employment land, for building industrial facilities. But building industrial facilities is not nearly as lucrative as building houses or building big box complexes. So the owners are highly reluctant to sell their land for those purposes. And many of them are holding on in hopes that their land will eventually get okay for residential or commercial development. And the appellants, many of the appellants in this case, are arguing precisely that, that Great to add it to the urban boundary, but really we want to build houses here. So the employment land argument is weak from that perspective, and given the numbers as I'll go through, uh, is weak from the perspective of need as well. Uh, 
we would suggest the real agenda here is being driven by those who want to use this for residential sprawl. Uh, food lands lost, I've gone through most of the other things here in terms of the kinds of problems that we're facing associated with it. So, current status, it was approved by council eight days before the 2010 election on a 14-2 vote. The two people who voted against it were Councillor McCaddy and Councillor Bertina. Councillor Bertina, now Mayor Bertina. Uh, and Councillor Johnson on the new council is also opposed to it. Uh, about a dozen appeals were filed, uh, including ones from the organization that I'm with, Environment Hamilton, and from Peter's organization, Hamiltonians for Progressive Development. Uh, the others are almost are all landowners, so uh, arguing one form or another. Some of them are arguing we want into the Aerotropolis. Uh, we left our lands out, we want to be in. Some of them are arguing, as I said, we are happy to be in, but we want to be residential. Uh, and uh, some of them are arguing that you have to buy our land right away because you're designating it as airport expansion lands. You may notice a bit of publicity about some of that affecting a couple of uh, individuals who are trying to sell a home near the airport and the city is refusing to buy it and they want to, they want to move to a retirement home, uh, they're at that stage in life and, and can't do so because the city won't buy the property. Even though it's designated a property can only be bought by the city because it's only going to be used for expansion of the airport. So that battle will also take place somewhere later in this hearing or some portions of that. The phase one hearing was completed in May. Uh, it was an attempt to try to get the issue of residential sorted out. The outcome essentially was confused. Uh, there was a decision in the first clause that there would be no residential in the Airport Employment Growth District. And in the second clause, that those who own land in there who wanted it for residential could argue that later in the hearing that their lands are better suited for residential. And presumably, if they were successful, that then their lands would be taken out of the Employment Growth District and they would then have an opportunity through the official plan amendment uh, process, the official plan of OMB hearing process, uh, to try and get their lands in that way. The phase two here 